from Jason and the rest of the team, we get all of our information on what products to, to bring to make your lives easier and get you home from work on time, whatever that means. Um, hopefully get, get you home on the weekend before noon. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hope to be able to come out to the prairies and get out all the way west and, and get, you know, see you, see you face to face so that I can talk about the problems that you're facing because the more I'm connected, the better I can be at my job. So that's what I do now. Um, this product is one of my passions. Um, you know, I talked to Jay a little bit about what, uh, what challenges you face when it comes to your pest populations. Um, in Southern Ontario, as you can imagine, we have a similar climate to, you know, closer to the transition zone and, and longer summers. So some of the pest pressures are, are quite different. Um, and I'm not downplaying your pest pressures, but they're quite different. So I had to sort of talk to Jay a little bit and do a little bit of research for myself. And hopefully I can answer any questions you have at the end of this and give you a little bit of insight into, into Celeprin. I, I, like, I think Jason, Jason can chime in later, but I think the turf specialists will all tell you that they certainly have products. You know, they're, we're comfortable with all the products in the portfolio. We love our portfolio, but there's certain products that you really feel passionate about. You really get attached to that. You get really comfortable with them. And um, because of the geographic area I work in, to, um, a Celeprin for me is one of them. Um, so I feel really, you know, I, I enjoy giving this presentation, sad as that sounds. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, background, you know, you know, the pests you're facing. We're going to talk a little bit of a background just to, just to uh, spend a little time outlining, you know, the issues that you face from my understanding of it. Feel free again to chime in and let me know that, you know, if I'm, I missed the boat on anything that you guys are, are facing, you guys and girls are facing out there. And then we'll get into a Celeprin. We're going to talk about not just the Celeprin, the 200 SC, which is the liquid version, the, the suspension concentrate. But we're also going to talk briefly about the granular version, which came out last year, may or may not have, have you know, hit the back of your memory bank and, and been, been brought to you, you know, to market. I know there's some that are still surprised when we talk about it now, but um, with COVID, things were all soft launches last year, but a Celeprin G is a, is a pretty special product because it, it, you know, it gives you all of the benefits of a Celeprin liquid and it allows you to put it in a spreader and save rinsing and washing and cleaning up. And, um, you know, once you get a, once you get a rate dial, then it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's no adding water and, and any issues, uh, you know, with timing and things like that, you can go out in the middle of the day and put this down. Here we go. So across Canada, major turf pests. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about BTA because BTA, I think, for most uh, uh, in the West, is a is a real issue. Sod webworm pops its head up for you. Um, European crane fly in the fall may or may not be an issue. Uh, cutworms for sure. Uh, and then I noted annual bluegrass weevil. I'm going to throw a, a just a slide or two. I'm not going to take a lot of your time. And uh, white grubs in some areas, but mostly coastal, uh, and then more out my way. So uh, I focus primarily on hopefully what will be an issue for you and your facilities. Um, there's a little bit of highlights on some things that uh, that uh, hopefully never come your way. Quite frankly, there's one of your friends, BTA, white grubs. Obviously, there's an image of a cutworm and annual bluegrass weevil. Um, Annual bluegrass weevil, interestingly enough, is uh, um, a major issue in southern Ontario, and it's, it's I've thrown a slide or two in here. You know, BTA was always an issue uh, across, you know, across most regions of Canada, and I would say up until about 15 or 20 years ago, it was the major issue all the way down into the southern tips of the, of, of the province of Ontario, but ABW has taken over. I've thrown a couple slides in here, and and honestly, I would I would hope I think you have a season long enough, but I would hope that you can avoid it until hopefully everybody on this call is retired because it it's really overtaken BTA when it comes to the discussion in a lot of places, including Atlantic Canada um, and Quebec and Ontario. So BTA, as you know, overwinters uh, in woodlots, and unlike uh, annual bluegrass weevil, which walks in in the springtime from the foliage. Um, BTA make a flight. So they make a flight in, they start laying their eggs in the thatch in May and June. I, I basically tried to territorialize this to, to your, you specifically. 
Um, dates may change, obviously. It can be a little bit temperature based. Uh, when you get into the 15 to 18 degree range, you start to look at temperatures where the adults are out laying eggs. Um, there is a phenological indicator that I'll highlight in the next slide here, but for all intents and purposes, um, you know, that adult flight is, is late in May and early June. And uh, the egg laying results in those grubs feeding um, for up to two months, quite frankly, on the, on the roots and the crown of the plants. The interesting thing is in a lot of years, if you have a fair bit of uh, uh, BTA, if it's a wet year, you can almost get away without even recognizing the symptoms of the damage. But as soon as you get into those droughty conditions, they pop up very quickly. Um, as they get to later stages, obviously they feed more aggressively, larger grubs need more to subsist. To, and so they will continue to feed more voraciously as they get larger. And it looks a lot like wilting damage in the summer. Sometimes you get a second generation. Certainly in Southern Ontario and Quebec, you get a second generation. I don't know if anybody on the call will be able to verify a second generation in, in, uh, in the prairies, but, but um, it is uh, quite common in many geographical regions of Canada. And the full bloom of spirea, specifically Van Hoot spirea, but the full bloom of spirea is generally an indication of the period at which egg laying is occurring. Um, this again goes to the date that we talked about earlier, but this is a, an easy and quick tip. Um, when you start seeing the, cyber, the spireas flowering, that is go time for egg laying. And when it comes to a celeprin, and we start talking about celeprin, um, because of its persistence uh, and duration of control, being down at egg laying or prior to egg laying is better than being late. Um, as grubs get larger, obviously it takes more of any product to do the to do to have the impact or do the damage to the population that it does, you know, when you when you get them at a very very small tender age. In cool wet seasons, uh, you know, you'll see the adults scurrying across the, gr the grass. Sometimes the damage in a good wet year is is almost less than the than the impact of the golfer seeing the black uh, beetles scurrying across the greens. You know, you can see a lot of those and actually not see any damage in some cases. Treatment timing about 15 degrees or higher. I've seen uh, GCSAA will talk about 18 degrees. So let's go with the low temperature. When you get to about 15 degrees, you're probably looking at that spirea bloom. You're probably looking at the adults flying in and laying eggs. And the grub stage lasts about four to eight weeks. So it, it can be a really painful four to eight weeks. And as you get later into those grub stages, um, you're gonna see uh, a lot more damage obviously because they're a lot larger. We're not going to hit too much on white grubs because it's more of a coastal issue than it is here. Um, they go from uh, they go from BC all the way out to. Uh, um, I'm going to actually stop this for a second and grab another presentation because I've got a better one online. Just let me grab my teams, Jason. I don't want to talk white grubs with you guys. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, chime in here a little bit too. Um, the worst insect infestation we've had was about six, seven years ago when you know snow broke early. We were golfing in March, and it, it, we got that second generation of pests, and we saw a lot of damage um, throughout. So you know the way this year's tuning up, if everything stays as is, it would be a watch out year for sure um, because of the potential early start in the warmer temps. Uh, we're seeing turf now uh, out there, which is fairly early for for this region, and if it stays warm, um, might be a bigger concern than most people have. <clears throat> Okay, just wanted to make sure I got the most up to date because I know I've been updating this. So we're going to go to this one and make sure that I've got this covered. Assuming this will advance. Cutworm and sod webworm. Cutworm, you generally see the damage July and August. Um, eggs are laid in the grass blades in the spring during the night generally. Uh, and the moth is the one thing that most people don't actually recognize when they're seeing a cutworm moth out, uh, out laying eggs uh, in that time of the year when, when uh, you know, prior to the damage occurring from the grub feeding. Again, much like sod webworm, um, both cutworm and sod webworm, you know, the, the insect itself doesn't feed on grass at all. So we're only talking about larval stages that become an issue. Um, in the case of sod webworm, they mature and begin feeding in June. And they're laying about 200 eggs, each one of those female adults. 
you'll see them feed through uh, July and August. It's very rare, uh, probably in your neck of the woods that you get two generations, but to Jason's point, every you know six to 10 years in Southern Ontario, Southern Quebec, you'll see two seasons at least. But in your neck of the woods, uh, to Jason's point, if you have an early season, you probably will tell me or Jason that you think you've had a second generation and you're likely bang on with that. Cutworm damage, you've all seen it, especially when you aerate in August, you start to see the, you know, the holes not filling over as quickly and you can see the nighttime damaging. They actually can travel up to 60 feet. Um, that's a pretty big distance overnight um, um, to travel. So you can imagine the damage can be quite ex extensive and can cover large swaths of your, of your shorter grasses. Um, primarily annual bluegrass and creeping bentgrass, but you can see they, you know, they're not overly selective when it comes to the tissue that they'll eat. And they're definitely going to prefer uh, close to cut turf, not just because you don't see the damage as much, but because that actually is the preference. It's easier to move around and you see it as the ball mark type of damage. Annual bluegrass weevil, we're gonna hit on this one quick before we get into a celeprin. So this is, this is an old map that shows uh, ABW hit, hit Connecticut in, in uh, 1931, and it took a very long time, obviously, with the way we traveled and the way pests vectored to sort of get around to the, to the immediately adjacent states. But by 66, you were seeing it in New York and now Ohio, North Carolina. So it's making its way. Um, it's in Canada, in Ontario, it's in Quebec. It's in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and now PEI. And last year, this, this, uh, I took this screenshot from uh, Paul Koch, who is communicating with Ben McGraw, who's obviously the professor of entomology at Penn State. They had identified it last year uh, in Wisconsin. So you're a ways away from seeing this pest, but if I was to, if I was to quantify it in term of, terms of damage, white grubs and ABW are the most prolific um, uh, creators of damage on turf. I am not downplaying all the other pests, but as long as you don't ever have to talk about these, be really thankful. Um, they become quite a problem in, in many regions, including coastal BC when it comes to white grubs. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different pests across Canada. You have the same ones as, as everybody else does. Uh, and you have a couple, you don't have a couple, thankfully, that uh, have caused a lot of problems and a lot of heartache. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Celeprin 200 SC. You know it as a Celeprin, interestingly enough. It's a suspension concentrate. You know, uh, the active ingredient is 200 grams per liter. So that's why it gets its 200 SC. We only call it a Celeprin because we didn't have another formulation. But now that the... Um, granular form, formula of uh, a celeprin is available. We've got to start referring to this as 200 SC for those who don't, who don't know. Uh, it's really good against BTA, white grubs, ABW, caterpillars. It's got a wide, wide label. Um, good preventative and curative performance. It's a systemic fungicide. So the interesting, the interesting thing to understand about um, a celeprin is it's got to get into the plant, which it does very readily. And it's got to be fed on by the pest that you're trying to control. If if the pest that you're trying to control is not in a feeding mode, you know, rubbing against it isn't enough. The only way to potentially get it into a non-feeding insect is for it to actually get on on you know its feeding appendages and then be ingested through the feeding action. But if they're not feeding on the turf um, and you have it down, it's not going to be nearly as effective. So that's why timing is key as far as getting on the front side of it. But once you've got it down, its persistence is, is excellent and um, the control can be fantastic. It's got high turf safety. Interestingly enough, this came up yesterday. We were looking at labels about an uh, unrelated product. Um, you'll see on the Ferentz label, label uh, toxicity to bees is listed. You'll see on, I think the Tetrino label, actually we were talking about that yesterday. You'll see toxicity to bees listed. Um, a celeprin does not have a toxicity to bees statement. I think that's because of how well it uh, adheres to the soil and gets bound up in the soil and in the root zone where it gets taken in by the plant. Syngenta has had talk studies that have shown that it doesn't actually get into the flowering heads even, so it can't even be impacted and, and, and taken away by pollinators, which I think is a really good statement in a world that is somewhat sensitive to um, 
to the bee population and how sensitive the bee population is to environmental or to non-environmental factors that, um, or to, to synthetic environmental factors that, that can put the hives at risk. So to not have that statement on, I think is a testament to the product. And uh, I thought that was an interesting catch yesterday. I hadn't actually realized we have it on our parents' label, competitive labels. You'll see that as statements now. The Celeprin is not that in that uh, in that same class or in the same class, but not in that same way. So chlorantranilopril is the active ingredient in a Celeprin. You don't have to learn that. I do. Uh, group 28, you see more anthrilic diamides within the class now. Um, Syngenta has two because Ferenc came out last year. Um, there's a third now from, from uh, Bayer that has now come into the, into the uh, pool. There, there are a, an exceptionally good class of control. Um, the reason you don't hear us talk and, and uh, drone on about ferrets is because when it came, sometimes things come a little top down. This is probably oversharing. In the case of a um, you know, it was the best chemistry, so we brought it. Um, and then ferrets was sort of you know, there is a product and additional option for people to make choices on products that, you know, are a little bit better on different pests. But I would say for the pests that you're dealing with, I don't know if Jason talks much about ferrets. I would think he probably doesn't, not to put words in his mouth, but it's because the celeprin persists for longer and, and uh, is a better mode of action on the pests that you're dealing with in your uh, geographic regions. Uh, it's a ryanidine receptor modulator. Basically, um, it causes paralysis in insects because um, it, it messes with the, the flow in and out of calcium within the muscle membranes. Um, so you get these ryanidine receptors that basically open up and let uncontrolled flow of calcium, which is the, the part of the insect in, within the muscle that controls twitch activity, motion. And as soon as that unmitigated flow starts in calcium, the insect is unable to be motile. It's unable to move its appendages. So therefore unable to feed itself, unable to move it, move around, unable to escape pests. So, you know, it dies very quickly. That's the mode of action and, and how it, and how it gets into the insect is through ingestion, through feeding on roots, shoots, and crowns. Um, predominantly you'll see uh, a lot of these are root feeding pests. So, you know, the, the mode of action is very quick and very deadly, but the reason it does cutworm is because it's, it's through the xylem mobile, it gets up into the plant and um, controls the pest that way. Uh, low water solubility and long residual action at low use rates. So we talked a little bit about this already. So the diamide basically messes with the receptors within the muscle. It comes from a, a Ryania speciosa, which is basically all you need to know is you know, these products, while they are synthetic in their production, come from natural origins. Most of these products come from natural origins in nature, and then they get reproduced, basically. Um, but, but the actual mode of action and the way they work is generally found out in nature. That's how most of these products get discovered nowadays. There's a picture of sort of the unmitigated uh, flow of calcium across the membrane. Um, this is the way in which you get that muscle uh, paralysis through the depletion of calcium. And the reason um, on the tox profile, it says, you know, it doesn't even have a caution label is because um, mammals have several orders of magnitude. So multiple times. So, you know, in a scale, like, you know, like in, 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 you know, what would be, so let's say level one in an insect is 10,000 in a, in a, in a human or a mammal. So that's why it's got such a favorable tox profile is because it is very, it's not inert to you, but it is very, uh, uh, low risk. So that's why there are no statements within the, within the profile or the label to say that, you know, you need to take extra precaution be besides the, the use of, you know, long sleeves and, and, and goggles. A uh, couple of, couple of rates, uh, white grubs, we don't need to talk about specifically. Uh, you, you, I highlighted here 880 mils because we talk a lot about 1125 mils on the label for, for pests like, uh, Suppression of chinch bug um, uh, might be in there for European crane fly. I certainly know it's in there for ABW, but the nice thing about where you guys, where, where everybody uh, in your geographic region is working, uh, you will be dealing with at maximum 880 mils as the high rate for control. I don't know if you get pressure so bad that you need to recommend, but you'd be technically outside of the label rate for the pests that are on the, on the label for, for your geographic region. 
So for Atanius, cutworms, webworm, and white grubs, 880 is, is the highest, which is really only about two thirds of the max in season. You can use up to 1,125 grams, um, or in this case, milliliters per haw, a straight conversion there. You can use that, that rate in season. It used to be a, a one and done. Now you can have a max, but because of a celebrant's mode of action, you shouldn't need it. Jason, if you want to give me a two or three minute warning here, if I get rolling, I, you know, I see I got seven or eight minutes, so feel free to skip, you know, cut me with five minutes and tell me to get on with it and get down to, I don't have a lot of slides for a celebrant G because the mode of action is so similar, but just give me the cattle prod when you need it. Um, basically, uh, you know, this, this, this study shows, you know, white con control by uh, white grub control by month. White grubs may not be your predominant issue. It's more showing the persistence of, of the control over months from treatment. I'm gonna show this in a couple of ways. Um, we, always, we always encourage you, but you know, it's a premium product, putting down an anthrilic diamide in general. Uh, Celeprin is, is you know, top of its class. You don't want to lose even a percentage of efficacy. This, the, the, the power and the message in this slide is, what I can tell you is even if you don't have the ability to irrigate it, you know, you're going to try and time it around moisture, around a rain event. But even if you don't have the ability to, to irrigate it, the drop off in the application, in the control, level of control is minimal. But when you're, you know, when you're paying what you're paying for an application of a celeprin, you know, you want every percent you can get. You want to reduce the grub population of whatever insect pest you're dealing with as much as you possibly can. So, the slide can be seen both ways. I'm, I need to get that two or 3% to, to, to maximize my value and get my, my ultimate control. But where I can't, I can still have, you know, almost the same level of control with the celeprin unwatered in. And this was, and this is, you know, a field trial sprayed on. This isn't in the granular form, but to that message, if you put it down in a granular form somewhere, it is going to stay there and be available. And as it breaks down, get into the profile and be very active and do what you expect it to do. Uh, I'm not going to highlight this one specifically because I have better slides to talk about this, but essentially when you make the application, you get, um, you get an immediate impact on the leaf blade. It's available, it's present, it's on the leaf blade. Some of it is going to end up in the thatch. If you water it in, it's going to get into the thatch sooner and it is slowly going to make its way into the soil and the root zone. Because it is xylem systemic, it needs to be uptaken by the plant in the root zone so that when the insect feeds on it, as, we, as I spoke about earlier, it gets ingested and, and does what it's supposed to do within the insect. This is the better slide. You've probably seen this from Jason. I just, this is, this slide is just, Spectacular. You don't think it's spectacular. I think it's spectacular. The half-life on Celeprin is 210 days. So when you think about your season, the product you put down, when you think about breakdown, once you get it to where you need it in the soil to do its, to do its worst um, on the insect pest you're dealing with, it, it's going to last for a considerably long time and it reaches its maximum level. Now this is a soil dissipation uh, curve from New Jersey. It was 2007. I actually had to resource this recently. It was in 2007 that this was done. It was a bit of a clay loamy soil, so it would probably be a slow. It would be a slower mode of um, motion, uh, um, a slow infiltration into the profile as opposed to say a sand-based root zone. But the message is the same. You can see the black line shows it was on the grass immediately. It took some time to work its way off the grass, but it was present on the grass for a considerable amount of time. And then you can see the bell curves start to work into the thatch and then the soil. At 90 days post application, the concentration was the highest in the study within the soil matrix. That means its availability for root zone uptake, for root uptake was maximized 90 days after application. Now, the question always is, yeah, but what about after day one? It's there after day one. It's available within the root zone immediately and it's available for being uptaken. And the plant will uptake it. We'll be taking it in immediately. The bonus is it will continue to be there available and it will continue to be uptaken within the, within the, the root zone and within the plant and translocated through all of the, the leaf tissue. So 
this is this is the strength that differentiates it from its competitors, even within this space. That you know, we we don't say we don't even talk about this with parents, and our competitors don't talk about it anyway. Here's what's in the landscape, right? You've got a Celeprim, you've got Ferrance. You probably won't have a lot of discussion about Ferrance because if you have a Celeprim, why would you need to mess with Ferrance? Um, Demand, uh, which is which is a Syngenta product for for ants, it's actually labeled in turf, but it doesn't really get sold through turf, and it's not a great product for. You know, we talk about passion. I talked about passionate products. Demand is not one of them because it's very hard to control ants. We now have Tetrino, which notes chinch bugs as control, which is not an issue for you, um, but it did uh, it did not perform as well as we have suppression of chinch bug on the Celtern label, but they have control. And I think that they both work very similar. Merit, which is always, you know, a question. It is still registered, but it's always, uh, it's always under eval because of the concerns, especially with the bee population. Delta Guard Arena, which is a neonic and has now been uh, put into question, and Pyrate, which was deregistered in December. So Pyrate was pretty good for getting adults, and it you won't see it by 2023. It's been deregistered. You can see the uh, duration of control. This goes back to, you know, when we're talking about um, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, when we're talking about the season, seasonality of pest problems, uh, you can see even 18 weeks and 18 plus weeks, the control for Celeprin versus Merit, which Merit is not a really good comparable comparison, but at the time, this was our, you know, the major comp competition when this few, these field trials were done, you can see that the persistence of a Celeprin means it really is one and done. Like we talk about one and done, it's because of this, it's because of data like this that shows you can put it down you can even miss your target time. That's why we're always saying, be early, don't be late. Why miss a pest when you can put down this one app in the spring and be done for the season? The other, the other opportunity is, well, we're going to go for cutworm at the end of July because we know we get cutworm in August. Well, that's fine. But you're also controlling pests in September and October when you're thinking about snow mold. So why aren't we going in May? Why aren't we going, you know, before June 1st, so that we can deal with cutworm in August and deal with any anything else come what may prior to that time. As long as it's feeding on tissue, we've got it under control. I go back to this a little bit. If if it's not if it's it's not a contact. So if it's not coming into you know if it's coming into contact with with ancillary or secondary um, uh, insects or mammals, it has low impact because they're not ingesting it. So very safe product to be to be using um, and very specifically targeted rates are here you don't need me to go through rates because i'm going to be short on time i'm going to race through this and get into um a little bit of uh, a celeprin g and then i'll be done there's not a whole lot to say specifically about celeprin g and the only reason that is is because the label is very much the same thing it comes in different it comes in a different formulation you spread it you spread it as opposed to spray it um but everything else that you'd expect people have asked what the carrier is it's calcium carbonate um it's of no concern it's not hot um you know you need to just like you calibrate a sprayer you need to calibrate a spreader you need to fig figure out your rates and you need to go out and apply the beauty behind this is if you're you know if you're dealing with a with an infestation you don't you in your territories and geographic locations probably don't get a ton of rough pests but for those who do or have tight areas it's nothing like going out with a spreader on a pre predetermined spreader setting doing a couple of passes and being done and parking it you know that can be done in 20 minutes a sprayer takes an hour to get out and get out and do an application so the g is pretty slick right you you, you roll up the bags and you throw them in the garbage um it's a pretty slick product to use and, and to be done with so that's why you know the uptake in a cell G is likely to continue to increase. There was a pretty good uptake last year. Um, the ease of use is that's the beauty of it is the ease of use. Otherwise, it's everything you would expect. So the presentation for cell G is the same as it is for cell uh, Here's some drug control studies. You know, Merit works for you. I, I have no doubt Merit has worked in the past. The nice thing is cell G does the same thing on white grub control, maybe a little bit better. The beauty is it goes all season. Get it down early and be done with it. Merit, Merit is likely to not give you eight weeks. Now, maybe that's most of your summer, but a Celeprin G is for sure going to give you eight weeks. And then the rates. If you look at the label, 
So it's almost a straight translation, right? So, so for, for what was 5.6 to 8.8 .8 milliliters is 56 to 88 kilograms per ha. So even, even the um, calculation or the, or the rate guide, if you, if you have become in tune with what your um, suspension concentrate, your liquid acetylene rate is, you already generally know what your rate is for the granular. Um, and of course, Jason can help you with a little bit of guidance on that. But I mean, it is so easy to work with. If you've got a comfort level with the Celeprin, you're already there with a Celeprin G. So I think that's my last slide on the Celeprin specifically. That is my last slide. So I did okay, Jason. I only did three minutes extra today. All good, yeah. Uh, thanks, I appreciate you joining us here, Scott. Uh, I'm, I brought Scott on board because he has worked so much with this product and, and you know, he mentioned that we don't have a ton of insect pressures here, but it's changing and it's coming. And I think we have a lot more BTA damage than you think because a lot of times it doesn't manifest into big, um, you know, issues on the turf. It's just more turf stresses that we misdiagnose. So I would... Uh, encourage you to keep a lookout on this. Uh, the biggest takeaways I, I, I found with the Celebrant, especially so Celebrant G for us, because a lot of times it's smaller acreage applications that we're doing. It's perfect for that. If you're spot treating a few greens, you can get out there and do it. Uh, you know, kind of fits our market a little bit better on that side of things. And the one and done is the key to that. When you looked at that 90 day in the soil uh, profile, if you looked after that 90 days, the next uh, the next two months, it's almost the same concentration level. So once it reaches that peak, it holds it really strong. So insect management is often a timing thing and if you're not in tune with it you miss the timing you still get damaged even though you've applied stuff so that's where celebrant to me i think is a winner you can put it down in the spring in april or may in our season have that season long control against pretty much anything you're going to face and not have to deal deal with it so well, it's funny jason to sort of let everybody into our conversations right like we talk about how we talk about how you know competitive product comes out and says, oh, like, why are you treating in the springtime? You know, you should be treating pests. You know, why treat pests you don't know you have uh, when you can go out and treat sort of the minute you have them? Well, you can do that with a celebrant. The point of a celebrant was, why not go out and treat when there aren't a lot of golfers knowing that you're done for the season and make that application? So I, sometimes it's in the messaging. And I think maybe we lost that message a little bit was people didn't understand. And, you know, I get it in Southern Ontario, especially people are like, well, I really don't have any pests. And the answer is, you know, I'm not dealing with cutworm. Yeah, you used to deal with cutworm because you used to go out and spray pyrate and then you'd spray pyrate again and then you'd spray pyrate again. Now you're doing a celeprin on your greens once and when it's done, it's over. So yes, you don't see cutworm. You can thank a celeprin. Don't just think that the cutworms have gone away. Like it's, it's a control strategy, right? Get out early and get done. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks, Scott. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'll have Scott's email up at the end of the presentation as well, or just reach out to me or uh, or uh, guys from Even Spring. So I'm thanks. gonna take the second part of this. Uh, um, do my screen share here. We see that up and running. See the screen? Good to go. Okay. So I'm gonna take over from Scott here and uh, look a little bit at. Uh, I'm just gonna bear with me here. I gotta get there. We go. Get to my slide. Look. Um, look a little bit at two things that I think are very important. I apologize if anybody caught my uh, CGSA talks. There's a little bit of overlap in this, but I do think it's an important message to get across. Uh, I want to talk about formulations and how they impact product performance, and I want to talk about contacts versus systemics and the timing of use of them because. Through my travels and work with Syngenta over the last two, three years, I've learned a lot in this. And, you know, there's a lot of great products out there that are used just slightly wrong and they don't have the same effect as uh, as you'd want them to have. Um, and I think uh, you'll be able to draw a few things out of this presentation to do that. So we start off with formulations. And when I talk to most superintendents uh, with respect to formulations, the first thing that comes to mind is often the negative experiences. And it's uh, it, it's often older stuff, but these clogged nozzles, the foaming, the just general tank mixability. And, and that's really how they relate formulations. It's how well it sits in that jug and how well it mixes. And that is an incredibly important part of the whole concept. But I think what I want to talk about today is the other things that we put in. I think this is, it's really what separates us from our um, our competitors is is what we, we do with our formulations beyond just jug and tank stability. Um, in a typical formulation, you're going to see about 50% water, 25% active ingredient, 
And then there's 25% of other stuff that's added in there in our formulations. And it can be adjuvants, anti-foaming agents, biocides, antifreeze. There's a whole gamut of things, hundreds of different things that we'll look at putting in different formulations to make them perform better, depending on what their the product actually is and what it's trying to achieve. And I want to look a little bit about what what goes into that and how it can make a product better. We'll look at some examples at the end. So when we look at making a formulation, we're constantly on the lookout for new formulation technologies, things that are going to make a good AI better. We know that AIs in the lab will address a pathogen and be really good, but that doesn't always translate to the field or into specific plants. So we want to try to do what we can to make it as close to lab performance in the field as possible. And to that end, we look at sort of how we can you know, improve its binding to the plant, because ultimately it's got to get on that plant and stay there to be effective. So we want to place it there. Also, once it's on that plant, we want it to disperse and move across the stomata or across the leaf blade if it's a contact um, to, to provide that protection. So we want to do anything in that in that 25 percent to um, to affect that. And and I think there, there's lots of products with the same AI that don't focus on this 25 percent or don't even put 25 percent in there. They're just on jug stability and, and profit margins. And, you know, we certainly want to make some money, but we do want to make a, make our product reliable and trustworthy. One of the things that's really moved up the chain as well in the last few years is tank mixability. Um, people are throwing a lot of stuff in tanks, fertilizers, wetting agents, all these different things. So it's very important. It's a very big priority for us that our products play well in the sandbox with anything you're going to put in the tank. So we spend a lot of time and, and money developing formulations that, that meet those criteria. The last two are drift control and jug stability. Drift control is really about, you know, if you pay for an AI and you want it to work on a pathogen, we want to make sure that we get as much of that AI in the area it needs to be to work um, and drift control is a key component of that take that variable out of there and then jug stability we want that product to work in year three if you haven't used it as well as it would work in year one when you first purchased it so that long stability within a jug will mean that performance will, will be good right throughout its lifespan then we look at within the plant and its interactions and really improved placement. We'll look at what, what the specific AI is going to do and what disease it's going after. And we'll put in things into that 25% that will place it where it needs to be to be maximum, have its maximum performance. Ultimately, we want the maximum AI in the location where the pathogen is most active. And if we can achieve that goal, then we're going to achieve better success out of that active ingredient. That same active ingredient that's really good on this disease, if it's placed in the wrong spot, will have no effect on it. So it's not that the product didn't work, it just didn't work because it didn't get in the right place. So doing everything we can to max, match the disease location and placement uh, is something that we'll add into there. And then uptake and movement in the plant. Once we get it on that plant or in the place it needs to be, if it's a systemic, we want to get it in as quickly as possible, eliminate any environmental barriers or human traffic barriers that can, uh, variants that can take away from the performance and, and really eliminate the amount of AI that gets into the game. And then once it's in the plant, you know, some of these, these systemics can move very slowly. So they're going to do the job, but if it takes seven days to translocate throughout the whole plant, you know, there, there can be a lot of damage done by that disease or pathogen in those seven days. So we want to get that mobility up there. And then finally, and not last but not least, for sure, is environmental safety, turf safety, and user safety. We want to add things to this jug that enhance those safety levels and make sure that you have a product that you're comfortable with and that's not going to impact the environment, but it's going to solve the issues that you have. The biggest hurdle when we look at this is Mother Nature, not dissimilar to you superintendents who on a day-to-day -day basis get thrown curveballs by Mother Nature that change how you have to do things. That's how we look at product performance. We, we know that Mother Nature is going to throw a bunch of different things at you, so we're looking at trying to lock in re reliable protection under adverse conditions. So essentially, we want to weatherproof this product uh, over a, a variety of seasons depending on when it's going to be used so that you can have consistency throughout. One of the first things we look at is rain fast. The, we want to try to put things in that tank that's going to make it as rain fast as possible, as quickly as possible. So the lower that number is, the better it is, because that means we've got the product placed, it can do its job, and Mother Nature's not going to have an impact on it. One of your biggest spends is going to be on uh, snow mold products or going clean products uh, in the fall or even coming out of winter. So cool temperature performance, right? These products, you know, need to be able to be absorbed and, and work under cool temperatures or sprayed under cool temperatures because, you know, oftentimes we don't get to choose when we're going into winter when we can spray. We need to get the stuff down. And, and if uh, Mother Nature's not uh, helping us, then we have some extra struggles. So we want to try to enhance that 25% in that formulation to make it better in there. Photodegradation is always a concern. 
when it's on that plant, we want it to be on there and stay as long as possible and not have sunlight or light impact how it performs. So we want to protect it from that. And then the last two, drift mitigation and application variables. Really, it's about what I talked about before. We want to get as much of that AI where it needs to be to do its job. Um, we understand that wind, rain, snow, sleet, heat can all impact that. So the more of those variables that we can tick off and take them out of play, the more consistent performance you're going to have and the better performing product you're going to have under adverse conditions. So the final aspect is we can get the product in place, we can do all these things, but it needs to be interact with the plant in a really good way that it can get retain, retained on the leaf blade, spread over the leaf blade and uptaken. So those are the three goals. And what we're trying to avoid is sort of off target uh, of any of that AI. You spent a lot of money on that AI to do the job. We want to place as many of those soldiers in place to attack that disease as possible. So this is a good example of uh, how formulation can change a product. Adepidin, which is the active ingredient in posterity, um, in its initial form, um, it, it's a decent product. It works good on that. But when we optimize that formulation, we got almost three times more uh, retention on the leaf spray. You can see in the video on the left there that this is just straight water, but you can see a lot of bouncing around. There's a lot of off off target stuff that's going to happen from that type of bounce, right? So we want to try to make a, a formulation that's going to get that AI there, stick and hold. Um, and this next uh, slide really kind of shows you that. This is a formulation without uh, an adjuvant in it. And we can see again that bounce that's happening, it's coming. You can see it hit and come off target. So if we're trying to place it in a spot, there's a lot of stuff that we've paid for that's not going to be there to do the job. Um, conversely, you're going to see a, a slide right after this that kind of shows when we add that adjuvant to make it stick and hold, you see a very different dynamic of those droplets, right? There's still a little bit of bounce, but much more of what you paid for is getting there. And that, that's really the ultimate goal in a formulation is we know the AIs work on the pathogen. But where we often miss is in our application and not getting it where it needs to be to do its job. So we're trying to put as much in that jug to make sure that we take any of the issues you may have, whether it be a weather or environment or sprayer or miscalibration, out of the question so we can get that AI there. Once we've got it there, we want to get it up and into the plant. So two things we look at are where it can be absorbed by the plants. So we want to change the formulation so maybe it's not just absorbed by the leaf stomata, but it can also be absorbed by root or crown. And then once it's in the plant, how quickly it moves, right? So we want to add things to that jug that are going to make that AI move and get into place quicker to address the disease challenges that you might have. So I want to look now that we've talked about formulations and the impact it can have, a couple of formulations that have made a difference and that are out there. And the first one's a max formulation. It's probably our strongest uh, performing uh, formulation out there. It's in a lot of our products. We know that Banner Max, Primo Max, Heritage Max, and Subdue Max. Um, the thing about Max formulation is that it was designed specifically for turf. It's one of the first uh, formulations designed for turf, for use on turf. It's got outstanding turf safety. It's a small particle size. It's extremely soluble. It plays very well in the sandbox with other products, so it's tank mixable, and that's a goal. And then it has improved uptake and mobility within the plant. So it, it ticks a lot of those boxes we talked about, about how we can improve the performance of an active ingredient in the field. And this is a really good picture that kind of hit home when I was doing some research on this, is the size difference. And that's really the, we look at this, this is a scale picture of a standard SC or WP particle on the right versus a max droplet on the left, that small little dot. And like in a football field, you're looking bigger is better. But when we're talking about disease management arena, smaller rules and max is an MVP in this uh, stage. And how does that size really impact? It's really about, you know, getting in the plant is it's the biggest uh, impact that it has. If you look here on the left, this is a stomata. And the, the orange box there is a standard size of a WP or SC. So two or three of these particles can get through a stomata at any given time. Contrarily, on the right, you see about 1,400 max particles can get through that door. And we're talking about getting that disease on and in to reduce any off-site environmental impact, but also getting it in to get in this, the vascular system to get to where it needs to do to do its job. When you have a smaller particle or a max formulation, you're going to see a significant benefit. And we have an example, a real-world example of this is when... Heritage came out, it was in a WG format, it's still available in egg in this format. And at max, the uptake was about 50% total in a really slow format. When we formulated the Zoxystrobin, the same exact same active ingredient into the max formulation, 
we saw 25% uptake almost immediately, and then a much steeper uptake curve overall to where in this trial, um, it's a closed trial, we got 100% of that product in. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It was the quick absorption, so we had less loss to environmental factors or irrigation or traffic. But we also had improved uptake at three different sites, leaf, crown, and root, as well as increased mobility. If you look at the, the picture on the left there, the yellow is where the things were inoculated versus other strobulins. And you see it moves in that plant much quicker and much better. And this is uh, highlighted in some trials against um, some common uh, strobies on the market, disarm and insignia. We see initially this max formulation allows much better quick uptake. So you're going to see faster action out of it. And you're going to see more of it overall getting the product because it's got a steeper curve. The other area where we've seen the max formulation improve the uh, performance of an active ingredient is in Trinexapac ethyl, which is our Primo Max or our growth regulator. There was a study done in uh, Australia over four different golf courses against uh, two different generics, Clipless and Trinex 120ME. And essentially the head-to-head -head versus rates, so they were extremely comparable. And on average in these trials, all four, there was about 15% better increase in clipping yield reduction by Primo over the, the generic formulations. It peaked out at 84 versus 73, and then its low was less at 60, 61 versus 20. So really, even in it, we were 20% better in the low uh, low end of it, but on average, it's about 50% uh, improvement in regulation. And that's extremely important when you're looking for a growth regulator. So you're, you're getting more bang for your buck. And this is really about getting more up and in that plant. Uh, the other thing it did was made it far more reliable. Uh, when we look at this, this is the studies where uh, this is against the clipless version of it. We can see where the black arrow is where Primo was. In the first week's observations, we saw an improved clicking yield over the competition. But also in the second week, the red red line was a, a continued increase uh, and a very consistent overall applications. That can't be said for the, the others. The generics that are not formulated as well, which is the exact same active ingredient, perform differently and variably throughout. And in fact, in one of them, um, it lost some of its suppression or regulation versus the first week. And we likely due to some sort of rain or irrigation issue that may have washed some of the AI away so it wasn't as effective. But consistent performance is what Max has brought to the table. And then finally, I want to look at the last formulation that's made a difference in the market is Medallion. Flutioxanil is a very unique. This is one of those biosynthesized uh, formulations that Scott was t talking about. It's uh, unique in that it's a contact uh, a, and a systemic, a local systemic. It, it, it acts in the soil, on the pathogen, on the plant, and in the plant. So it's, it's really unique mode of action, but it's also got a unique formulation. And in this formulation, it's got a strong bond to the cuticular wax and a, a strong spreading uh, component to it. So the formulation allows it to spread. We're looking at a picture here of a competitive product. Um, versus medallion and you see much larger particle size this is they're both at what 3480 times and 3500 times so comparable uh, uh, exposure uh, uh, zoom ratios um, but you see a much better spread of the medallion versus the other there's lots of holes where where a pathogen get through and it's just not bound as tightly to the leaf so it's going to be prone more to wash off and when we zoom out uh, or zoom out a little bit to see it a little clearer not so close up we see a nice even spread and that's really what you want out of a contact which medallion is Another addition to that formulation was a, was a water modifier or water stabilizer. Because we know that even from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, you can have very diverse water conditions and that can impact the performance of your fungicide. So by having this stabilization from five to eight pH and, and a variable uh, level of hardness, uh, you're gonna see a much better performance anytime you use it. And that's really what we're trying to achieve. So the analogy I like to use when I talk about formulations is this car analogy. We have two cars, they're both orange, they have four wheels and an engine. And if we assume the engine's exactly the same, and these they're, they're driving on a straightaway with no wind or no other variables, they're gonna come in very close uh, to each other in a race. The minute we add rain, snow, curve, or anything mother nature's gonna throw at us, we're gonna see the car on the left drop off significantly in performance, and the, the car on the right really kind of take away from it. And that's essentially how we look at our formulations. We're taking AIs, which are the motors in this, but we're putting things around them that are gonna make them perform better under variable conditions and, and perform better against the disease diseases that you're going after. I want to just shift gears a little bit. We've talked about formulations. We understand the importance of it. The second part of this uh, this discussion is really about 
you know, what fungicides do you choose to address your disease issues, contacts or systemic? So I think of differentiating these and where they play a role is important to understand when you're making decisions as we roll into the seasons. Um, so you're looking at preventive versus curative strategies. And a lot of times people think preventive versus curative is really just about if I get it out ahead when I don't think I have it, that's preventive. And that's true to a certain degree, but you have to choose the right fungicide to really get the benefits of that. <clears throat> If you do use contacts and systemics as a combination, you eliminate resistance issues and all of that. But to me, more importantly, is you, you really give yourself a fighting chance to stay ahead of the disease curve and reduce the plant stress. You're going to provide longer lasting control. You're going to use less, you're going to have less scarring. You're just going to be ahead of the disease cycle. So you're going to have better playability. And you're generally going to reduce the number of applications when you combine these two products. So in order to understand that, it's important to look at the complete disease cycle. So at the bottom here, you're going to see a bar graph. It's got contacts in the top, fun systemics in the middle, and then a combination of the two in the bottom. The blue reflects where the products are highly effective, and the orange reflects where they're less effective. So in this very first stage, the early preventive stage, the germination stage, when the environment around it is kind of perfect for that, that pathogen to come to life, uh, systemics aren't going to do anything. They'll be in the plant. They're not going to have any impact. So really, when we're talking about pr true preventative, you need to have a contact at that early stage because it's going to take care of what's happening outside the plant. It's going to take care of that pathogen before it can cause any harm to the plant. And if we can attack the disease at this stage, we're going to be in the best possible thing. So if you're using just a systemic and calling yourself preventative, you're not being truly preventative. You're, you're waiting till the stage of disease infection to do it. So I encourage you, if you're thinking of a preventive program, I think it's fabulous. You're going to use less chemistry. Your plant plant health is going to be better, but consider having uh, contact in your formulations at, or in your um, tank mixes at that front end. The next stage is still what I call preventative. It's that early penetration stage. So the nice thing about this stage is both systemics and contacts will be useful in this stage. They're very effective because you have a little bit of plant penetration, no damage to the cells yet, you can see, but the pathogens there on the outside. So both will work. So this is a perfect time where a tank mix would be at this stage of the disease. A contact systemic tank mix will take care of, clean up the outside, anything in the earlier stages of this, and then have a protection inside the plant for anything that may have slipped through. Once we get to the curative stage, contacts aren't as effective. You really need that systemic inside the plant. As you can see here, there's some cellular damage happening. You know, you're going to start to see some visible plant stresses. This is when we need a curative. And this goes back to what we talked about with the fungus, uh, with the formulations earlier. We really want to have a good formulation that's up and in the plant quickly because we're seeing damage happening. And if it takes too long to get in there, that damage is going to be more extensive. So a quick acting and quick, quick uptake uh, formulation is going to have a better result you know, even if it's the same AI, you're going to see one AI perform better than another based on how well it can be uptaken. We saw the differential in heritage max versus heritage. That's exactly what's going to happen here. You'd see more turf disease using heritage than you would heritage max just because of the speed it takes to get up and in there. And then this final eradicant stage is where we have two phases of it, this blistering. And this is what I call the reactionary stage. This is often when you see the blistering on the plant. And this is when a lot of superintendents will decide to treat. At this stage, contacts aren't effective, um, as effective as, uh, as systemic. Systemics are really what you need to take care of all that uh, the fungal damage inside. You see a lot of cell damage inside that plant. You need to get something in there quickly because you're already behind. You're in stage four of a five uh, stage disease infection cycle. So you really need to get something up and in there quickly. So your choice of a good formulated product is key in this too. Know how mobile it is within the plant. Know how quickly it can get up in the plant because if you choose wrong, you're going to get more damage than you need. I also encourage, even though contacts aren't, aren't uh, uh, functional at this stage, because we're behind the scene, we want to clean up what's behind it with the contacts, but also this very next stage that we see, the blistering stage is the sporulent stage. So there's likely some of this already happening. So I think once you're into that blistering stage and if you see any damage on your leaf, it's important to add a contact and a systemic so you can take care of this future. Uh, these spores are really going to be your future disease development. You want to clean that up, you know, set the clock back to zero with it, clean up any outside uh, uh, spores that are happening outside the plant prior to that, and then the systemic will protect the plant on the inside. So as you can see, contacts are key at the front and back end of it, and they're really key for reducing your pathogen loading outside the plant to stop any future infections or to stop infections from happening, period. So they're key components to it, but need to be used at the front end and back end of any infection to be effective, uh, uh, to help effectively control disease ahead of time and, and before the next infection. So when you're looking at contact for systemic or in your program, you want to you know consider what's going to be in the leaf and when you need it there. 
what's on the leaf, you know, are the contacts active in the soil? Uh, my, uh, Secure and uh, Medallion are very strong, active in the organic and thatch layer, at reducing populations there. So that's kind of really being preventative and ahead of the game, using that contact, getting taking care of the pathogen, not even on the leaf blade, but also where it lives in the fat and match. And then, you know, you're choosing a product, is it uptakeable by shoots and roots, right? Because if it's washed down and it's available by roots and shoots, then you're not going to lose as much product and you're going to get more efficiency out of that active ingredient. So I want you to think when you go into the season, think outside in protection. If you can start protecting outside the plant, where the pathogen lives, reduce the loading, protect the plant on the outside, follow up with systemics on the inside, and then choose good formulations if you're a little behind the game to make sure you get it in there and can it work under extreme conditions, you're going to have a much healthier turf. So I'll just finish off now, and I think I'm pretty close to on time there, made up a little bit of time. Um, we're very proud to offer the most diverse pest management portfolio in Canada. We have three contact fungicides in Medallion, Secure, and Dacano, um, all different frac groups, great resistance management, as you can, as we just gone over, extremely important in the front and back end and taking care of the pathogen outside the plant. We have five uh, systemic uh, fungicides, Posterity, Heritage, Velista, Banner, and Subdue. Um, of these three are really good to Microdokium, one of the main things that you guys are dealing with, but Basically, any disease that you need can be taken care of within these. And they're very strong formulated. We saw how good the max formulation can be for impro improved performance. And then we have in three insecticides that can take care of any of the pest needs you have on that side of things. Again, not a big issue now, but as the, as the weather's changing and the winters are milder, I think we're going to see more and more insect issues uh, moving forward. So this represents eight different frac groups, so great diversity and rotation, um, plus a growth regulator in there. We have the industry leading formulations in all of our products, so they're going to perform a little bit better than other AIs that may be the exact same. Um, so as you're heading to start the season, keep some of the tips you saw in mind here, and hopefully they can help you make some good decisions um, and help you continue to produce the quality playing surface that you're known for and can produce uh, uh, great golf conditions for golfers that are the population is growing more and more each year. So thanks for all that you guys do out there. I wish you luck in the coming season. And I'm going to be around seeing you guys. Uh, I can't travel out of province. So I'm going to hop in the truck and come out and uh, do a good round and see everybody there. So reach out to me if you have any questions. Any questions for anybody today? All good. Hi, Jay. Hey. Uh, I've got one quick question for Scott. Yep. Um, yep. On the Acelaprin G, we had um, we had a customer using the product, and they found the color to be very difficult to see when applying. Uh, we're starting to see some of the lawn care operators using it, and they were that was their first response was, you know, I can't tell if I'm applying not only if it's the low rate, it's kind of hard to put down, you know, a hundred grams or a little over a hundred <laughs> grams per thousand square feet. Um, so the logistics of not only applying such a small amount, but being able to see where you're actually applying it. Is there any talk of that? Is there um, any, any sort of maybe reformulations looking at making it a high vis product? Cause uh, like I say, being able to see where you're applying it properly is pretty critical, right? Yeah, that, that makes total sense there. So is there any talk? There is as of today. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to the right guy because he's got, yeah, you got the story. right guy. That's a, that's good feedback. And I know exactly what you're talking about. That makes total sense. And we've not really discussed this. It's actually the first time I've heard it, but it's not a surprise to me. Um, okay. Right. Cause every time you put down, anytime you miss when it comes to landscape, like that is value lost. So I can appreciate, I mean, they're not worried about Fido. They're not worried about anything, but it's like, how do we get, you know, maximum efficacy and the littlest amount of down to make that rate. Uh, that, leave that with me. Unfortunately, right. I have no answer, but you have the right person. That's the best I can do for you. <laughs> and just so you know, Craig, you did ask me and I talked to Danielle or I threw it up her way, but th there was a transition between Scott and Danielle. So Scott's taking the lead on this and he'll be the right guy. We're, yeah, our thoughts were that if this sort of takes off, which it feels like it to us, um, yeah. you know, can you, can you make, can you make it in a different prill size for say, you know, the landscape uh, side of things? Whereas, you know, you're not going to need a mm -hmm. sort of a 120 greens grade Yep. Uh, greens because yeah, we're starting to see populations growing here. Yeah, sure. that's a good catch. 
Yeah, that's a very good catch. And then you see fertility products that they put, you know, they're pigment, they're, they're making purple and pink and you can sort of custom blend and color. I guess the question will be, I'll have to investigate the cost of that, right? Like sure. it's a premium product in the first place. Like what, what is the value add versus the, versus the cost add? It's a good, uh, leave it with me, leave it with me. I'll, I'll make a note of it and I'll start inquiring. That's a good question. I pre appreciate it. All good. Any other questions or good to get back out to your turf or other seminars? I'm sure you're all zoomed out at this stage for everybody. I just want to thank Craig and Ian and everybody at Evenspray for allowing us to come and present. And uh, like I said, I'm always a phone call away uh, if anybody has any questions on any of our products or uh, help with your fungicide programs or things along those lines. <clears throat> On behalf of uh, Even Spray, I want to thank you guys for participating and uh, all those that have uh, logged in as well. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Thanks. Have a great day. On to my next meeting. Thanks, Scotty. Take care.